Deep beneath the freezing surface of the Barents Sea, a Soviet Delta-class submarine runs silent. It carries 16 R-29 nuclear ballistic missiles, enough firepower to level the entire eastern seaboard of the United States. For the US Navy, tracking these ghosts is the highest priority. But there is a problem. The Soviet Navy has gone dark. Their communications are protected by the holy grail of cryptography, the one-time pad. To understand the magnitude of what Sarah Martinez achieved, you must first understand the wall she was banging her head against. In the world of code breaking, the one-time pad is a myth made real. It is mathematically unbreakable, not hard to break, not takes a million years to break, impossible. The concept is deceptively simple. You have a message, you have a key, a random string of numbers as long as the message itself. You add the key to the message to create the cipher. The receiver, who has the exact same key, subtracts it to get the message. Once the key is used, it is destroyed, burned, never used again. Because the key is random and used only once, there is no pattern for a code breaker to find. No frequency analysis, no repeated words, just noise. In 1979, the National Security Agency at Fort Meade was filled with the most powerful computers on Earth. Cray-1 supercomputers hummed in climate-controlled basements, crunching numbers at speeds that were unimaginable to the public. But against the Soviet submarine fleet's one-time pads, these billion-dollar machines were useless. They were trying to find order in chaos and there was no order to be found. Enter Sarah Martinez. She wasn't a high-ranking director. She wasn't a computer engineer. She was a cryptanalyst working in a windowless office, surrounded by stacks of tractor-feed printer paper. While the agency was looking for a technological solution, Martinez was looking for a human one. She understood something that the mathematicians often forgot. Encryption systems are perfect, but the people who operate them are not. The Soviet system relied on the generation of massive books of random numbers, the pads. These were distributed to every ship and submarine in the fleet. The rules were strict. Use a page. Destroy it. Never reuse it. If you reuse a page, the mathematical immunity evaporates. But Martinez began to wonder about the conditions inside those submarines. Imagine the life of a Soviet cipher clerk. You are 20 years old. You are underwater for three months at a time. The air is recycled and stale. Your officers are screaming at you to encrypt a patrol report immediately because the burst transmission window is opening in two minutes. You have a stack of pads. You are tired. You are terrified of making a mistake that could get you court-martialed. And in that pressure cooker, Martinez suspected, lay the vulnerability. It started with a hunch. Martinez began collecting raw intercepts of Soviet naval traffic. Not just the high-priority stuff, but the mundane chatter, position reports, weather updates, logistics requests. To the untrained eye, it was all garbage. Streams of five-digit groups that meant nothing. She wasn't trying to decrypt them. Not yet. She was looking for isologs. In cryptography, an isolog occurs when two different messages are encrypted using the same key. If the one-time pad rules were being followed, isologs should not exist. Every message should have a unique key. Martinez pushed aside the computer printouts and cleared her desk. She grabbed a stack of raw intercepts, a graph paper notebook, and a number two pencil. She began to compare the cipher text strings manually, day after day, week after week. The silence of her office was broken only by the scratching of graphite on paper. Her colleagues thought she was wasting time. The computers had already flagged these messages as unreadable. Why was she staring at them? But then, three months into her search, she saw it. Two messages, sent by two different submarines, six weeks apart. The first ten groups of numbers were completely different. But starting at the eleventh group, the cipher text showed a statistical anomaly. The distribution of the numbers wasn't random. It was too similar. It wasn't a direct match, which is what a computer would search for. It was a ghost match. A mathematical echo suggesting that somewhere, thousands of miles apart, 
two exhausted Soviet clerks had opened their codebooks to the exact same page. It was the crack in the dam. When a one-time pad is reused, the security collapses. If you have two encrypted messages that use the same key, you can subtract one message from the other. The key cancels out. You are left with a jumbled combination of the two plain text messages. It's like listening to two people talking at once. If you can guess a word in one message, you reveal a word in the other. Martinez didn't rush to her superiors. She knew one match wasn't enough. She needed a network. She needed to prove this wasn't a fluke, but a systemic failure in Soviet procedure. She began to build a depth. She collected thousands of intercepts. She hand-wrote them onto large grid sheets, lining them up, sliding them back and forth, looking for that statistical echo. She worked 12-hour days. Her eyes burned. Her fingers were stained grey with graphite. She was performing one of the most complex mathematical tasks in the world, using tools that hadn't changed since the 19th century. By the fifth month, she had found 12 instances of pad reuse. She began to reconstruct the pads themselves. She would guess a standard Soviet naval phrase, patrol area, and apply it to the cipher. If the result on the other message made sense, she had the key. If it came out as gibberish, she erased it and tried again. Guess, check, erase, write. Slowly, words began to emerge from the noise. Sector, north, speed, reactor. She wasn't just breaking a code. She was reading the minds of the Soviet Navy. The moment of truth came in a briefing room at Fort Meade. Martinez laid out her worksheets. She didn't have computer printouts or simulations. She had a notebook filled with handwritten Russian text. She showed the admirals and the directors what she had found. She pointed to a reconstructed message from a Delta III submarine. This vessel, she explained, is not patrolling the Barents Sea as we thought. It is currently transiting the Greenland-Iceland-UK gap. The room went silent. If she was right, the US Navy had been looking in the wrong ocean. They tasked a P-3 Orion Maritime Patrol aircraft to check the coordinates Martinez had deciphered. Six hours later, the confirmation came back. They had a sonar contact. A Soviet boomer, exactly where the pencil and paper math said it would be. For the next 18 months, Sarah Martinez became the most dangerous woman in the Cold War. Her method was refined. She taught a small team of analysts how to spot the human glitch. They mapped the psychological patterns of the Soviet clerks. They learned that clerks often reused pads from the back of the book because it was easier to flip to. They learned that certain submarines were repeat offenders, likely due to lax discipline by the officers on board. The NSA began reading Soviet submarine orders in near real time. They knew when the subs were leaving port. They knew their patrol sectors. They knew when they were surfacing for maintenance. The terrifying ghost fleet of the Soviet Union had been stripped of its invisibility cloak. American attack submarines began to shadow the Soviets so closely that they could hear the chefs dropping pans in the galley. The strategic balance of power shifted overnight. The Soviets believed their communications were secure because the math said they were secure. They didn't account for the pencil. It lasted for a year and a half. Eventually, the Soviets realized something was wrong. Their submarines were being intercepted too often. They audited their communications security. They found the lazy clerks. They changed the procedures. The window slammed shut. Digital computers eventually caught up. Algorithms were written to do what Martinez had done by hand, scanning for depth and coincidence indices automatically. The era of the manual codebreaker faded away, replaced by the silicon giants. But for that brief critical window in 1979 and 1980, the safety of the Western world didn't rest on a microchip. It rested on the graphite point of a number two pencil and the patience of an analyst who knew that even in a world of machines, human error is the ultimate vulnerability. Sarah Martinez retired quietly years later. Her name isn't in the history books alongside Turing or Friedman, but in the silent war beneath the waves, her legacy remains. She proved that no code is truly unbreakable. As long as a human being 
is the one typing it.